If you think the stronger dollar is behind the bull market, wait until you hear this. Joining me now is Louis Gav. He is the co-founder and CEO of Gavacol. So happy to have you here at SIBO RMC. You're one of the esteemed keynote speakers and your speech was compelling. Thanks so much for being here. That's very kind, thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here in Dublin. Thanks so much for having me. Many people are talking about the strength of the dollar and the roaring stock market, but you have another perspective. Tell us about that. Well, I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is the dollar is roughly, if you look at the DXY index, it's roughly where it was a year ago. Uh, so yes, it was weak. Uh, uh, for six months, and it's been strong the past six months. Um, but to put the entire emerging market meltdown that, that we've seen on, frankly, a fairly minor move uh, in the U.S. dollar, a fairly minor move in the whole you know, scope of things, the dollar has had much bigger rallies historically, uh, I think to me is, uh, comes up a little short uh, as an explanation. Uh, for me, the bigger explanation, uh, and note I say this as a guy who spends most of his time studying China, is that uh, the bigger shock for me, at least this year, wasn't as much the dollar going up uh, as the renminbi going down 10% in just a few weeks. Um, that was uh, something that I'd never seen before. Um, and so the renminbi devaluing 10%, uh, again, over a couple months, um, I think that creates a bigger shock. Um, if only because you know today the world's manufacturing floor is China. So when the renminbi devalues 10%, that's actually a deflationary shock uh, for the world. Um, it means that everything you and, and I buy at Walmart, Costco, wherever else, will be cheaper by 10%. As the renminbi goes down 10%, what do you see? You see Apple share price shoot up. Why, why not? After all, China's manufacturing costs are all based in China. And if the renminbi uh, goes down, you can conceptually think that's bigger margins for, for Apple. Uh, if it manages to hold its prices, which Apple has a good track record of doing. Um, you see Amazon shoot up, you see Walmart shoot up, you see Costco shoot up. But the flip side of that, of course, is you see emer emerging markets melt down. Um, partly because emerging markets, unlike what is usually thought, i.e. emerging markets are a levered play on the US dollar, Today, emerging markets are really a levered play on China. Something fascinating is happening, and I love that you brought this to the surface, because in the U.S. we hear much rhetoric coming from President Trump about made in the USA, mm -hmm. but that same rhetoric is happening in China. Made in China 2025, That's right. which is putting some competition on some of our bigger industries, including the airline industry, and, and you mentioned this a little bit with yeah. H&A being told to go back, deal with your aircraft business, and mm -hmm. forget the debt that you have at Deutsche Bank. Let's just yeah. move on. So explain what you think is happening here. What's your perspective? I think Made in China 2025 was a, a very bold policy outlined by Xi Jinping so, at, at the National uh, People's Congress uh, this past fall. And that's changed. I think it's somehow changed the perspective that uh, a lot of American policymakers, but also American big businesses, uh, have about China. You know, when Xi Jinping comes out and says, look, by 2025 we want to produce our own jet airliners, we want to be a leader in semiconductors, we want to be a leader in artificial intelligence, we want to be a leader in fintech. I think five years ago, if Xi Jinping had said that, people would have laughed. People would have said, yeah, whatever, continue producing cotton socks and, and gym shoes, and um, you know, we'll talk about it later. Today, when China comes out with such strong ambitions, Nobody's laughing anymore. And I think, um, in fact, if you're Boeing, if you're Intel, if you're Caterpillar, if you're John Deere, and China comes out with these strong statements, you think, hold on, you're supposed to be my, my, uh, my client. You're not supposed to be my competitor. Um, and all of a sudden, it changes the dynamic in the US. Because if you think of the US, the biggest pro-China lobbyists were always American big businesses, saying, hey, look, we make a lot of money there, so let's not bash China too much. Today, I think that is changing, and with that, the atmosphere is changing in Washington, D.C., where increasingly China is no longer seen as, look, this is just a cheap place where we can you know, make uh, low-end products, but increasingly China is perceived as being not only a geopolitical competitor, because China is expanding geopolitically with its One Belt, One Road plan, but also an economic competitor. And uh, so that changes the dynamic. And I think my fear is today the dynamic in Washington is for 40 years, 
the dynamic was let's embrace China, let's integrate it into the global economy, let's integrate our supply chains and basically you know, play to our comparative advantages and every, everybody uh, gets along and try to produce as much stuff as possible for the cheapest price. To now all of a sudden the dynamic is let's disentangle the supply chain. Let's make in America what we should be making in America. Um, while China itself is saying, well, I want to move up the supply chain. Um, and by this aim of moving up the supply chain, obviously it puts it in conflict with the U.S. And I think that conflict will dictate uh, market behavior, not just for the next few months, but for years to come. And it gets deeper when you add in the oil move that China's making here, tapping into Iran and Europe and saying maybe oil should not be valued by the U.S. dollar any longer. And I think that's an, another very bold move by China, which of course is bound to you know, anger the U.S. Treasury, anger uh, U.S. policymakers. Yes, you know, one of the biggest macro moves this year is China launching uh, this RMB oil futures. Um, and initially I think most people were very skeptical, saying, yeah, this is a gimmick. Um, Already, though, you know, this is we're six months in. Um, China, that RMB oil futures now accounts for 12 percent of uh, globally traded oil futures from nowhere, uh, just a few months ago, um, and so it's growing very fast. It's growing very fast, partly because, you know, some of the world's big oil producers, uh, Russia, Iran, Venezuela, have a fraught relationship with the United States, um, and so. You know, if you're Russia, if you're Venezuela, if you're Iran, you might be looking for ways to diversify uh, your, your client base, diversify your revenue base. Um, and so in comes China and says, look, why are we both trading with each other in U.S. dollars? This leaves us dependent on the willingness and ability of American banks to fund this. It leaves us dependent on the American government indirectly. Uh, let's trade in renminbi. And, you know, by making this statement, China is basically obviously trying to undermine the U.S. dollar's uh, uh, reserve status. Now, if you, you know, that's a question I often ask clients. I often ask, what do you think is the U.S.'s single biggest comparative advantage? And the U.S. has lots of comparative advantages. Some clients answer, oh, it's the rule of law. Others will answer, it's the fact that we have the best universities in the world. And all that is true. Um, and those are big comparative advantage. But for me, the single biggest comparative advantage of the U.S. is the fact that the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. It allows the U.S. to run massive budget deficits and massive trade deficits without any funding needs. Um, and so if China is now trying to undermine that, no wonder the U.S. is not feeling very pro-China right now. So we cannot count on China to buy up our debt as we are falling deeper into debt. Potentially. Uh, not only China, but Russia, Iran, Venezuela, Qatar, and whoever uh, basically starts to go for this China policy of trying to de-dollarize Asian trade and de-dollarize um, um, uh, commodity trade. Um, and by the way, this desire by China to de-dollarize commodity trade, de-dollarize Asian trade, has only been reinforced by uh, everything that's happened in recent months. You know, when, when the U.S., when President Trump tells China, look, I don't want to run a trade deficit uh, with you anymore, it, he's, what he's saying is, I don't want to send you U.S. dollars anymore. But if you're China, you think, well, hold on. If you don't want to send me U.S. dollars anymore, how am I going to pay for my oil? How am I going to pay for my soybeans? How am I going to pay for my copper? If you don't want to send me U.S. dollars anymore, then I have a, you know, a national security imperative to shift commodity trade away from dollars to renminbi because if I don't do that, uh, then you know that means that basically I'll be my funding will get completely squeezed. So it's uh, I think we're going through very very important transitions today in in essence the economic and financial world order that has prevailed for the past 50 years. I feel like the world might fall apart sometimes. No, it's not that bad. <laughs> not that bad. Okay, that's a good it's thing. Not that bad. But you are watching some signals in the market about the bull market. And you mentioned IPOs have been yeah. sluggish. Uh, sl I think sl uh, sluggish would be good in existence. <laughs> I think, you know, one, one of the, uh, the baffling things of where we are today in the market is um, we're 10 years into a bull market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've had all these articles. It's the longest uh, running bull market we've ever had. Um, you know, by any measure, U.S. valuations are, are, are fairly stretched. 
this is the time of the cycle where you would expect all the friendly bankers from Goldman City and elsewhere to be knocking on your door and saying, hey, you like this paper, here's a bunch more. Uh, doing deals. Doing deals, launching IPOs, etc. cetera. Um, the oddest thing about this market cycle is here we are, 10 years in a bull market, no, and you know the phones, the phones are crickets. There's like no, mm. n no deals happening whatsoever. What you're seeing on the flip side is private equities co taking company privates. What you're seeing is M and A. What you're seeing is massive share buybacks. Yes. Um, yes. To the point where, as as your CEO was was pointing out, as Chris was pointing out today, at the current pace of share buybacks, uh, in 17 years there will be no more listed companies. Um, you know, and one of the jokes I personally use is, you know, if if stocks were an animal, we'd be going to benefits for them at this point because it'd be an endangered species. Um, the U.S. has gone from 8,000 listed companies to 4,000 listed companies in the past 20 years. Um, so, you know, we are living in this age, in essence, of capitalism without capital, uh, or the capital structures are changing. It's moving away from listed companies to private equity. And, of course, you know, for those of us who work in listed market, uh, it makes things challenging. Well, let's make it so everyone can sleep at night. Yeah. <laughs> what are some great risk management strategies that maybe you're using, or what are you doing with your money right now? Um, to be honest, the um, I think we're entering a, a tougher period in markets, um, where you know, if I look at since basically January 31st, you, you know, you start the year, everything goes up. Since January 31st. Every single asset class is down apart from U.S. equities. Um, and then I look at the U.S. equity markets, and increasingly the, uh, the growth, which had been very much driven by tech, is getting narrower and narrower. Um, tech itself, relative to the benchmark, actually made its high back in May, and it's been sort of range trading since then, partly because within the tech index, you've seen semiconductors roll over, you've seen social media roll over, and increasingly the growth has been just a few, a few names. So, you know, the... The parity was, frankly, in August, where World MSCI XUS was down 2%, MSCI US was up 35 because Apple was up 20 and Amazon was up 13 mm -hmm. So you've got two stocks that basically had 300 billion of market cap in one month uh, to the US. Um, to me, that strikes me as, as somewhat unhealthy. So today, um, I would be inclined to be, to be more defensive on portfolios. And one of the other things that strikes me is that basically since May, what you start to see this huge dichotomy between the U.S. and the rest of the world, um, what you've seen since May is much more of a rotation even within the U.S. towards the more defensive sectors. So outperformance of healthcare, outperformance of staples. Um, and to me, that tells me that, uh, you know, Perhaps this bull market, which has been fairly long, um, could, could enter a bit of a correction phase. And it could enter a correction phase either because global growth is soft. You know, growth in China is rolling over. Growth in Europe has been very soft. Um, growth in U.S. housing is rolling over. Growth in U.S. autos is rolling over. Either because growth is soft or simply because um, um, interest rates, you know, the Fed continues to tighten. Interest rates continue to go up. One of my big quandaries, something I've never seen before, uh, and something I didn't expect, is this year, um, when I look um, at what's happened, you've had a complete meltdown in emerging markets. Um, if, you, you know, if we'd sat down in January and you told me, by the way, Turkey's going to be down 50%, Argentina's going to be down 50%, China's going to be down 25 I would have said, load up on U.S. Treasuries. You can't own enough U.S. Treasuries. Because throughout my career, each time you had an emerging market meltdown, U.S. bond yields fell at least 75 or 100 basis points. Um, this year, you've had the emerging market meltdown, and you've actually lost money on U.S. Treasuries. Correct. I think that's an important signal. Um, it's an important signal that, you know, perhaps we are coming to the to the end of a market cycle, and you know, maybe we're entering into a transition phase. Time for the defense, as you say. Time thank for the defensive team. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. wonderful to speak with you. Thank you Great very much. Insights. Thank you very much.